Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today you're going to meet a documentary filmmaker and director who focuses on social justice, and in particular, the sometimes precarious relationship between the individual and the state. Her debut film, called Conviction, has been critically acclaimed and is currently airing on Amazon Prime. It's about a 16-year-old boy who was wrongfully convicted for the rape and murder of his 15-year-old classmate and was finally freed after spending 16 years in prison. This powerful film moved me so much that I just had to reach out to the woman who made it, Gia Wirtz. Gia, welcome to our show and thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for having me, Harvey. I'm so excited to talk to you. Gia, it's almost unheard of for a first-time filmmaker to receive such glowing accolades for a debut film and to have it picked up by Amazon Prime. The movie was shown at 12 film festivals around the world and won three awards. Congratulations. I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much. You know, I was as shocked as the next person, so... <laughs> You quit a 20-year career in fashion to pursue filmmaking. What took you so long to pursue this passion? You know, when I was about 19, 20 years old, I had read Reuben Carter's book, The 16th Round. And I just loved that book and it just made such an impact on me. And so I was really passionate about wrongful convictions, but I wasn't sure all those years what I could do to help. I'm not a lawyer, you know, a podcast didn't exist back then. I just didn't know what I could do. And fast forward to 2014, the serial podcast came out. And when I listened to that, I was really just beside myself at how the subject of serial and non side was treated and, you know, that he's wrongfully incarcerated. And that's what really uh, kind of re instigated this thing inside me where I thought, you know, I want to do something. And I just didn't know what. Um, it's a little bit of a long story, but I ended up um, organizing a fundraiser for a non's legal defense fund. And as a result, I met his family. And so I happened to be at a non's post conviction hearing. And there was a camera crew filming there. And as they were filming, the family ended up telling us that they're actually filming a documentary about a non. And so I was watching them. And it was to me in my naive mind with zero experience in filmmaking, I saw these three people, it was like a producer and a a cameraman and maybe a third person. And I thought three people can make an HBO doc. Well, then I can make documentaries. And I was like, oh, I got this. I had a 20 year background in photography as well. So I knew my way around a camera. And I thought that's something that I can do. And so I went home and uh, enrolled into the New York Film Academy into a documentary program and learned what I could and, and just started because I thought that would be the way to reach a broader audience. And that's what I've been trying to figure out is what can I do that would actually reach a larger amount of people to raise awareness for the cause. Well, considering you've got a current film on Amazon Prime, I would say you're reaching a broad audience. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> your film Conviction deals with the story of Jeffrey Deskovic, whose conviction for rape and murder in New York was ultimately overturned when it was discovered 16 years later that another man committed the rape and murder of the 15-year-old victim. How did you first learn about this case? So I actually didn't know about this case initially. And then when I was organizing that legal, uh, the fundraiser for a non-legal defense fund, uh, the girlfriend that was organizing it with said, you know, we should have an expert speak at this event because we are not experts in wrongful convictions. And I said, yes, absolutely. That's a great idea. And then she said, I know a guy. I met him at a party and he had just recently been released from prison. And his story is very similar to Adnan's, whereas he was also in high school. It was a classmate that was murdered. Um, he was wrongfully convicted around the same age. And so he could probably speak to this, you know, firsthand and people could relate to a non story and Jeff's story. And I said, absolutely, let, let's meet him. And so she introduced Jeff and I, and that's how we, we met. And then fast forward five years later, when I started to do the documentary, uh, he was the only person I knew in real life that had been through this, had lived through this. So I reached out to him right away. He you know, was the first person that came to mind, of course, and he was down. And so he said yes, and we started filming like, right away. When I was doing my research, I learned that you were very inspired by the story of Reuben Carter, who you've mentioned, the famous African-American boxer in the 60s who was wrongfully convicted of murder. What was it about his story that moved you so much? 
Yes. When I was when I was only 19, 20 years old, I really believed in the justice system and law enforcement. And I believed that they were just there to protect you. And there was never they never did anything wrong. You know, that was just my opinion back then. I had never encountered anything like that. So when I read his book and, you know, also saw the film with Denzel Washington and the hurricane, I was shocked to learn that this happens where police officers can be corrupt or you can actually be accused or convicted of a crime you didn't commit. It was just news to me. It's not something I thought happened in the world. Of course, I was young and naive. And so that just stuck with me. And then reading Reuben Carter's book, it was such a raw account of a human being who's innocent being put through this horrific scenario and being put in prison and having the world believe that you're this kind of monster that has committed these crimes when you haven't. And and that really just left a mark because I thought not only would it physically be hell to be in prison, but mentally it would be hell to have people, your peers and everyone believe that you're this horrible person if you're not, you know, and so it just left a mark. And then you've also mentioned that you were also inspired by a podcast series about another wrongfully convicted young man, Adnan Syed. How did his story make you want to shine a light on wrongful convictions as a filmmaker? A non-story really, really hit home, I think, because I already kind of had the the thought in my mind with the Reuben Carter story. And then Adnan, uh, I was much older when I listened to that story. So I actually felt like there, I could maybe do something to help, you know. Um, secondly, Adnan's family is uh, South Asian and so is mine. And so there was a lot of things about his upbringing and his story that I very much could relate to. Uh, like, for example, in Serial, they said a lot of people thought that he could have been guilty because he lived a double life where at home he was this, you know, good kid that, you know, went to the mosque and stuff. But then at school, he had a girlfriend and he would maybe drink or whatever, smoke weed or whatever he did. And, you know, growing up as a first generation immigrant, we all lived that life. You know, we couldn't tell our parents that we were doing these things at school because our parents would have a heart attack and we wanted to protect them from that. And so uh, I very much related to him. And I also realized that that those actions don't make you a murderer because otherwise we would all be murderers because we've all lived that life, you know? And so it just, it just, it just resonated. And I thought, you know, I really want to do something to help him. And he's also close to my age. He's actually my younger brother's age. And I thought if something like this can happen to him, it could happen to my brothers as well, which was, you know, just horrifying to think about. And I also thought if this did happen to my brothers, I would want somebody to help them. And so I thought, well, you know, just like that, I should, I should help Anon in any way that I can. And, you know, I haven't helped uh, him much at all, but we did that one fundraiser. And because at the time, that's all I could think of to do was to raise some money. And then fast forward to the post-conviction hearing is when I realized, you know, at least we could raise awareness um, by reaching a greater audience. Now, turning to the Jeffrey Deskovic story, from what you were able to find out, Gia, how did this miscarriage of justice happen that the police and the prosecutors were so sure that Jeffrey Deskovic was the guilty party? So Jeff's story, it's so sad. The, the police really pinned it on him and it was almost like they were grooming him to pin the murder on him. They took Jeff around, I believe, for almost two months mm -hmm. after the murder occurred to show him the crime scene, give him details about the crime and all of these things prior to taking him one day out of county um, to a police station that he hadn't been to without his parents, without a lawyer, without anyone knowing his whereabouts and interrogating him for seven hours to get him to falsely confess. And so, you know, it was, it was really misconduct on their part. They, they knew what they were doing and they manipulated the 16 year old into giving them a confession. Part of the incredible power of Jeffrey Deskovic's story is that after getting out of jail, he went to law school and became a lawyer, and now he works to help exonerate other people who've been wrongfully convicted. What an amazing man he is. Yes, yes, he is. He, what he's done with his life is remarkable. It's such a remarkable story. Not very many people start where Jeff started and end up where Jeff is today, but he has such a, he'll say this himself, he has such a uh, goal and he knows exactly what it is and he just sticks to it and he says even though, you know, 16 years of his life were taken away, he, it did 
tell him what his purpose in life is and not everyone knows what their purpose in life is so he feels like that was a you know positive thing that came out of what happened to him but he's just got a one-track mind and he's focused on helping other people who are wrongfully convicted and it's just wonderful to watch did you have any difficulty getting jeffrey to participate in the film I didn't. He said yes almost right away. What was interesting, which is, you know, people that will never see in the film, but kind of behind the scenes is Jeff grew up in prison from the age of 17, you know, till 33 or whatever year it was when he got out 16 years later. And uh, so he has uh, a lot of after effects of growing up in prison. He spent his formative years there, you know, um, surrounded by, he was a kid going in and he was in adult prison, surrounded by adults who were hard criminals and I'm sure murderers and what have you. And, uh, you know, he talks about this in the feature length. I'm working on the feature length documentary about Jeff's story currently. And he talks about this in the next film where he almost lost his life. They tried to kill him one time in there and they hit him over a head with a weight plate. And, and so he's lived through, he lived through some really scary things at a very young age. And so he has a lot of after effects. And so what you won't see in the film, it, a lot of times we'd be filming or there'd be a loud noise or a phone would ring and he gets very agitated and he gets very uncomfortable. And I asked him about it after months of filming when I felt comfortable and I asked him about it and he said, yes, um, you know, in prison, when you can't see anything and you're just in this box, sounds are what let you know what's going on around you. And any loud sounds were a sign of danger. They were, you know, keys jingling or anything loud um, would mean that the other guards are coming for someone or there's been a brawl or someone's getting hurt or attacked. And, and so that has stuck with him, that loud sounds kind of bother him. And so there's just a lot of interesting things in the uh, making of the film that, that I had never experienced or known about that I learned about Jeff and about people who, you know, live through this. Gia, were you surprised at how calm and even tempered Jeffrey was when he was telling his story? I had the feeling he was talking about it almost as if it happened to somebody else. Oh my God, yes, absolutely. And I asked him that actually. I don't know if it's in the short or if it's in the feature. You'll have to tell me if you saw this, but he, he, I asked him, how can you be so even keeled about this when you talk about it? And he said exactly what you just said. He said that it's, it was so traumatic that almost to, to deal with that trauma, he almost thinks that he's talking about somebody else. It's like another lifetime and he separates and kind of compartmentalizes it. So it seems, so he feels like he's talking about somebody else and not himself. And that's why he can talk about it that way. And in my opinion, uh, Jeff, you know, he got out in, I think it was 2006. So he's been out for a while now and he's told his story so many times because he's such an advocate. He does a lot of public speaking. So I think just then he says that's therapeutic for him too, but I think telling the story so many times has also made it easier to talk about, I'm sure. A little bit on um, autopilot almost, if you will. But uh, most definitely, I was very taken aback about, I, I j often joke that Jeff talks about his time in prison almost as if you just asked him what he ate for lunch, so casually. And not many people would be able to do that. Have you had the pleasure of seeing the film on the big screen at any of the film festivals or did COVID prevent that? COVID unfortunately prevented that this far. What happened was we actually had our premiere at the Anthology Film Archives in New York in the Lower East Side. I was so excited because it was such a you know wonderful place to have your first film debut. And two weeks before the release, the theatrical release, the pandemic hit and all the theaters got shut down. And so we, and then after that, you know, all the subsequent ones got canceled or postponed or they got done virtually. Uh, so we haven't, but now the theaters reopening, we're going to be rescheduling a lot of those. So we will get to finally have that experience. And I think we're going to have a uh, viewing here in Calgary first. I can't wait to hear your reaction to seeing it on the big screen, the way it was meant to be seen. Yes, yes, I can't wait for that. And, and to be in a room with the audience and get real audience feedback and see, you know, what they think of it and what we can improve. I, I just can't wait. Now, Conviction is a 20 minute short film. But as you've mentioned, you're currently making a full length feature film based on the Jeffrey Deskovic story. Do you have any idea when that will come out? 
So it was supposed to come out this year, but of course the pandemic <laughs> really put a wrench in that. We have two shoots left. The film is almost finished. We're in post-production, but the two shoots that we have left, one is to shoot inside the prisons that Jeff was at when he was serving his sentence. And the second one is to shoot a woman in Colorado who was instrumental in helping Jeff, beginning the process of Jeff's release. And so I need to fly there. And with, you know, flights not really being safe at the moment, and, and prisons are completely shut down, even for visitors, even family members, which is really terrible. I don't know when we'll get to do those two shoots. So everything is dependent on when we can finish filming. However, during the pandemic, since we couldn't film anything, uh, instead I just worked on editing the film. And so the film is almost finished and we just kind of left holes where we need to fill in those uh, following shoots. And so I'm hoping by the end of this year, we can finish it for our release next year. You know, when I was watching Conviction, I was thinking to myself how great it would have been if a film like that had been shown to us at law school. Do you know if the film has been shown at law schools? It has been. Uh, that is one thing we've been able to do during the pandemic. What a great question. Um, we've, we've showed a handful, of a handful of schools and it's been so fantastic because it's been with law students and they've just had such insightful questions and it's so funny because they all watch the short and afterwards we always did a Q&A and some of the questions I got from those law students were so thoughtful and just amazing that those are the questions that I ended up using to interview people for the feature length film. So you'll see a lot of the questions that the law students asked me answered in the feature length because they were just so thoughtful. I can't wait. You know, in, in recent years, true crime documentaries have been increasing in popularity. There's Ghosts of Sugarland, Long Shot, Interview with a Serial Killer, all on Netflix. And those are just three off the top of my head. And Out TV has three true crime documentaries that I appeared in that were released this year. Why do you think the public has developed such a fascination with this genre? You know, you're so right. And it's so interesting. And I'm, I'm not 100% sure why, but obviously there are documentaries used to be kind of secondary. People thought of documentaries as something you watch, you know, in school as an instructional video and stuff like that. Or you'd see Discovery Channel and nature documentaries, but it wasn't like it is today with this true crime genre. And I, I'm not sure what caused it, but I do know that people today there's such a sense of this armchair detective like i'm sitting behind my computer but i can help research this case and i can be the one to find out this missed detail and everyone even i have that i always think like well what happened here let me dig further and everything is at our fingertips as far as resources so we can actually research stuff and look into things and use the freedom of information act to even get documents and things that you can't find online so I, maybe it's just access I mean, i'm not sure but it's very fascinating Gia, you've been quoted as saying that the largest audience for true crime films is women. How did you know that and, and why do you think that is? Yes, that is so fascinating to me. So I learned that originally just by reading about some podcasts and some documentaries who had tracked uh, their audience and they had found that about 75 to 80% of their audience listeners and viewers are female. And once I read that, I thought, wow, that's, that's just a crazy statistic because such a high number. And so I started to research about it. And then I came across a New York Times article that spoke to it. Uh, and that just took me down, you know, rabbit hole of researching more about it. And, and I learned a lot of interesting things that I talked about on the list TV show you might have seen as well, um, which I can share the link to. But I guess studies show that, that women are just much more likely than men to fear becoming victims of these types of crimes. And, you know, that's true. Women are far, far more often victims of these types of crimes. And so they watch these documentaries and these shows so that they can learn from what happened in these scenarios and then change their behavior based on these true crime stories. So it's almost like a, a way to learn for them. And I can attest to that myself. I, I, I heard about, I lived in Canada, obviously at the time, I heard about the Central Park Jogger case when that happened decades ago. And it just stuck with me. I never forgot it. And I never in my life jogged in a park ever. And those are the kinds of things that women do when they watch these, these shows, they see what these women did and then they think, okay, I'm gonna avoid dark streets at night or I'm not gonna walk through a parking lot alone or I'm gonna check the backseat of my car before I get in. And then these stories in turn provide life-saving tactics for these women. And so it's just really fascinating that 
I guess women watch it as a means to survive if this ever happens to them. Or a cautionary tale or a, a, a piece of education. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's so interesting. Well, I wish you would make a film about people whose lives get into trouble after having met online, because that happens a lot. That does happen a lot. And with everything moving online, it's so easy for people to, uh, you know, not show their true selves from behind a computer screen. Yeah, that's a big, big problem. And it's a scary. That's very scary. So what kinds of films are you going to make next? Right now I'm working on the feature length documentary about Jeff Deskovic. Right. And right. then the third one, I'm just starting to research. And because Jeff does have a foundation that helps other people who are wrongfully convicted, uh, I'm lucky enough to have him uh, recommend some cases to me. So I'm just trying to figure out who the third, my third film will be about, but I don't know yet. Now, you know, Gia, in order to be a really good documentary filmmaker, you have to be a good interviewer. And based on what I saw in conviction, I think you are. <laughs> you know, the things uh, that I enjoy the most about documentary filmmaking are one, being behind the camera and getting great shots. And second is just talking to people. And that's probably why you think that I love interviewing people. I love hearing people's real life stories. And especially when people are very open and candid and raw about what they've been through. And uh, I often get criticized for this in real life, not in documentary filmmaking, but I'm not scared to ask inappropriate questions or questions people consider inappropriate. And that really serves me well in documentary filmmaking because you have to ask the difficult questions to get answers to, you know, the 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 real things that people have been through and, and stuff like that. So um, I think that's maybe why why that comes across on film. Is it true that audio is more important than video in filmmaking? Yes. Absolutely. And you know, the first person to tell me that was a professor at New York Film Academy. And I did not believe her. <laughs> because I thought, how can that be? We're watching. It's, it's a visual. We want to see a good video. But if the audio is bad, and people can't hear what the other person is saying, they're just going to tune out on uh, audio is definitely more important. And then I've learned over the last year and a half or so that if you have great audio, you can always get great b-roll to put with that audio, even if you didn't get great footage the first time around. Audio is, is definitely king. <laughs> Gia, you probably know that I'm a criminal court judge, so your movies and your artistic mission resonate with me deeply. Now, I know you appreciate that no system is perfect and courts make decisions based on the evidence presented. But I want to take the opportunity to ask you, based on the research you've done, do you have any advice for the people who work in the criminal justice system about how we can prevent wrongful convictions? I'm no expert in this, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but I, the thing that I notice the most that I keep coming back to over and over when I'm working with people and talking to people in this world is that if there was consequences for misconduct, prosecutors or police officers, right now, it seems like too many of them have immunity. So if they do anything wrong, they just don't have to answer to anybody. And if that wasn't the case, if there were consequences for misconduct, then often the people who are doing it um, knowingly, who are, are in Jeff's case, for example, the detectives knew what they were doing and they purposely pinned this on a 16 year old. They, I think, would be deterred from doing it, knowing that they could also go to jail because what they would be do doing would essentially also be committing a crime. But that's not the case right now. And I think that's that to me seems like the big one of the biggest changes that we need to see. Now, in addition to being a filmmaker, you have your own fashion company called Studio 15, and you were a regular contributor to Forbes magazine on the topic of e-commerce. Do you still have time to do that? I do. I do. But uh, my fashion uh, career, I kind of left behind. And so I do still run Studio 15, but I do it more as a side hustle uh, for because I enjoy it. It's more of a hobby than anything. And I do write for Forbes and I love writing for Forbes. They're such a great outlet to work with. And they also have such a broad reach that that's a really uh, fun thing for me to do. And I still do that as much as I can. Well, Gia, I'm so pleased that you came on our show. You're immensely talented, and I can't wait to see the feature film of the Jeffrey Deskovic story. And I hope you'll come back to our show with every new project. 
I would love to. And it's such an honor to talk to you. I was, I've been so looking forward to this conversation. I'll absolutely come back anytime. And as soon as I have a release date for the feature, you'll be one of the first to know. <laughs> thank you. I really look forward to it. And I think you have a very, very bright future. So thank you for taking the time to come on our show and talk about it. Thank you, Harvey. Our guest has been documentary filmmaker and director Gia Wirtz. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on HarveyBrownstoneInterviews.com.